So overall, we're going to have four kinds of exceptions. Uh, we have three ways of handling things, but four kinds of exceptions that might be handled that way. Uh, so let's imagine that we have some user code alongside kernel code. Both of them are running on the same CPU. You know, at one, we're in one set of instructions or the other at a time. And there's some other hardware out there, like a clock or a network card or a mouse. So one thing that might happen is that uh, an interrupt is generated by the other hardware. So those kinds of things I just talked about, keyboard, network packet, and so on. These kinds of exceptions are asynchronous with respect to the program. Nothing in the program said, OK, there's a network packet now. Instead, the network packet came from the outside. Uh, these kinds of exceptions, interrupts, are generally handled completely by the kernel. Uh, and so the kernel will handle that and then resume the program. The instruction that was happening didn't really trigger an exception, and so the program can carry on. So let's just put interrupt in a little table down here where we'll keep track of the four kinds of exceptions. Uh, it's asynchronous, and the usual action is to resume. Another possibility uh, is a trap. So a system call, for example, we would call that a trap. There are other ways to request a breakpoint for debugging from within a program. Uh, these are things that are triggered by the program itself. Uh, so they're synchronous, part of the normal control flow. Um, and there are things that are intentional. When you made a syscall, then the code really meant to, to make a syscall there. These things uh, trigger an exception in the CPU, which goes to the exception handler in kernel mode. And uh, typically for a trap, what we mean by this category is it's something handled by the kernel that will then just resume the program. The next uh, case uh, category is called fault. And that's when something happens in the program but it's not something that was intentional. It's generally unintentional, like referencing address that doesn't exist. So if a user program tries to use a memory address, tries to write or read from address that doesn't exist, triggers an exception in the CPU, and the kernel is going to handle that, and the way it handles it depends on exactly what went wrong. Uh, if the memory address is not valid just because it hasn't been allocated at all, then the kernel might by default just turn off the user's program and stop running, you know, exit with an error. Uh, on the other hand, if the memory is supposed to exist, it's supposed this virtual address is supposed to be mapped to something, but it just hasn't been loaded in yet. It's still sitting in the disk. Then the kernel may um, yeah, may arrange for the memory to be pulled in, the content of memory to be pulled in from the disk, and as soon as it's ready, it may resume the program. Right? Uh, actually, it might retry the operation. Since the memory wasn't there before, it can't just resume without getting the memory. It has to retry the memory reference. Uh, as we'll see next time also, the, the kernel may involve the user program to have some decision on what to do there. Okay. So faults, we're generally going to retry or abort. And finally, aborts, these correspond generally to hardware errors, like the memory has gone bad. Uh, in this case, the kernel just has to stop things. Uh, maybe it can stop the process and maybe it'll recover. Uh, who knows? Okay. So aborts, we don't generally worry about we will be mostly interested in traps, faults, and interrupts. So these exceptions explain how the operating system can control user code, how it can run programs and constrain them from doing everything, even, those pro even though those programs get to run directly on the CPU. Uh, external interrupts mean that the kernel gets the opportunity to handle any network information that comes in, or mouse movements for certain older kinds of mouse devices. Um, a timer interrupt, meanwhile, make sure that the kernel gets control often enough. So your program can't just ignore uh, the rest of things that are happening on your computer indefinitely because the controller will periodic, the kernel will periodically get control from a timer, timer interrupt. Uh, system calls via trap. That explains how the code that you write is able to communicate with the operating system and get it to do privileged things on your behalf as long as uh, those things should be allowed. Um, and finally, it explains how your whole computer doesn't fall over when you uh, overwrite an array or attempt to reference some address that isn't supposed to be there. The kernel gets to take over and fix things up to keep the computer running.